All right, so that crisis is averted and now we're on to the next step. I have one of the door frames assembled here and you can see what we're going for for the most part. This presents some unique challenges for us now when creating the groove that goes all the way around the interior for the panel that will sit uh, in the center. So in a lot of cases, we're gonna have to make a stopped groove because if the groove goes all the way through, for instance, on the, the left-hand style here, if this groove down the center goes all the way through, it's gonna poke out through the top and the bottom. That's no good. Same thing for uh, the top and bottom rails. The way it's designed, if the groove goes all the way through, it's okay here because it stops. This uh, style gets in the way. But if the groove went all the way through, it would be visible from the outside edge. The only one that we can go all the way through on is this little skinny style because it's blocked on both the top and the bottom. So it's okay to go through. So what we're gonna need to do is figure out a way to make a stopped groove. And really the only way that I think is reasonable to get a nice clean cut is to use a quarter inch bit in the router table and then very carefully drop it onto the bit in the right location, make the routing cut, and then lift it at the end without going all the way through. Now the special situation here comes into play with the top piece. Obviously, with the top piece, you can't exactly use a router table to do that. I mean, you might be able to, but it would be really tricky when this curve comes into play. And at this point, I'm not messing around when it comes to my router table. <laughs> so the only thing I could think to do at this point is to use the slot cutting bit again. The bearing will guide through the cut all the way around this curve, and as long as I'm going in the right orientation, I should not have any problems creating this groove, and the groove will follow the contour of the top, so that when we make our panel, I'll just make sure that the panel also follows this contour, and it should work just fine. So uh, let's go to the router table. We'll start with the straight bit, do all of our stop cuts, and then we'll move to the slot cutting bit. Now the door panels are gonna be constructed from spalted maple. I think it's gonna provide just an incredible contrast and the inky colorations and things from the fungus inside the wood is just incredible. It's gonna look gorgeous. So um, the thing is I've got full four quarter stock here and I need to slice this up into thinner boards. Uh, as a matter of fact, we need to be about a quarter of an inch for the panels. So that affords me the opportunity to slice these you know, into two pieces. I'll have a little bit left over when I'm done, but I could slice it in half essentially and mill them down so that what I'm left with is a book match. So when you open these up, the pattern is a mirror image of itself from one door to the next. So it should look really cool. Now I'm, I'm only really making quarter inch cuts here, just over a quarter of an inch. So it's not quite as sensitive as when you wanna cut very, very thin veneer, but the idea is still there. The, the, the more perfect you can get your setup, the better. The results are always going to be better that way. So I've got my fence clamped to the bench and it's actually ready to go. But I did wanna point out this blade. When uh, I was at IWF this summer, I had a chance to stop by the Laguna booth. And to be honest, over the past few years, I haven't really paid much attention or known very much about their stuff. But I saw a few demonstrations. I, went as, I was extremely impressed with the, uh, the Resaw King uh, blade that they had there. So um, when I came home, I, I got in touch with them and uh, fortunately got a free one from them. So I'm giving it a shot. Previously on this saw, I had a wood slicer, which was doing great. I had no uh, complaints about it at all, but this monster blade just caught my attention. So um, I really want to dedicate this machine here to resawing and veneer. So it's good to have a nice, you know, wide blade on there that's really, really heavy duty. You can see the teeth on here are actually, it just looks like a mini table saw. You know, it's something that they can actually resharpen. So the blade, although initially the investment is pretty high, uh, it's something that the maintenance on it when you get it, instead of replacing it, you're gonna get a, uh, a sharpening done on it. So overall, it's a pretty cool blade. And so far my results with it have been incredible. So if you're in the market, definitely check that out.
All right, so I've got my panels cut and I want to just make sure that I keep the orientation set, which one's going to be left, which one's going to be right. And they are book matched, so it's very important to keep those in the right orientation. Now, I've got one of my door frames here and I'm going to use the door frame itself to show me exactly where I need to make my cuts for this top section right over here. So I basically align everything using the frame itself. And I've already put some pencil marks here on my panel showing the depth of the uh, small vertical style, the bottom rail, and this way I could line it up as if the panel were already in place. Line everything up with the pencil lines, and it's as easy as just tracing the profile right here at the top. Okay, so of course, I don't want to cut exactly to that line because that line represents the outside of the frame and we need it to go in the frame and uh, we need it to go in, as a matter of fact, by three-eighths of an inch. So I've got a little compass here, and I'm going to set that guy to three-eighths. Yeah, just under three-eighths, just to give it a little breathing room. And I will simply trace along and follow my line. And now I can just make this cut at the bandsaw. Now before I assemble my doors, I want to do one last sanding of all of the door parts. And that means easing all of the edges, bringing it up to 180 grit. Now I've written a lot of notes on these boards just so I know which end is up, which end connects to, you know, what rail connects to what style. So what I like to do at this point, since all of that information is going to be gone, I actually like to transfer it to the joinery itself. So I've got a number three here matching with another number three part, and I'm just gonna write that on the tenon. And that can stay there forever, that's not a problem. But obviously keeping it on the face is not gonna be a good idea. So once you have all of your marks transferred, then just go ahead and sand away. You always know exactly where that part needs to go. So the moment we've all been waiting for, it's time to glue up the doors. I've got everything laid out here. I've got my clamps ready to go. Always trying to make sure I reduce the amount of time it takes to get this job done. You don't want glue drying on you. So a good amount of glue here in the mortise. Some glue on the little baby tenons and the little baby mortises. So put one in, get the panel in place. Now the panel just floats. No need to glue it. We want it to be able to expand and contract with the seasons. Okay, the bottom piece. Give it some clamping pressure from one side to the other. And from top to bottom. Now while the doors are drying, it's a good time for me to start cutting this ebony up into the strips that we're going to need to make the caps. Uh, I'm going to start at the table saw. I've already got this band saw into uh, a little bit over three-eighths of an inch and I'm going to cut it on the table saw to just over three-eighths of an inch. Most of the holes that I'm doing, there's going to be a few smaller ones, but most of them are approximately three-eighths by three-eighths. So what I want is something that's just a little bit bigger than that and then I could taper the bottom and as I, you know, pop the little cap in there, it'll force the fibers out a little bit, give it a nice tight fit. So I'm starting here at the table saw. Now there are a lot of ways you could probably make these little caps and honestly I haven't really researched it very much so to tell you the truth I'm just going to wing it and do it the way that I think makes sense. Now I have a strip here which means I have two sides that I can work on at the same time and if I cut these into smaller pieces I can have multiple pieces in which I can do two sides and that's one possible way of batching them out. So I'll just show you with this big piece exactly how I'm going to do it here at the miter saw. I've got a stop in place that will stop the piece and keep it in, in the same position for each cut. The bevel angle is tilted to 15 degrees. So each cut is going to slice off just a little bevel on the top. 
So when it's all said and done, what we're left with is something that's gonna look a little bit more like a pyramid. And then by hand, I'm gonna smooth everything and uh, get it to the point where it's nice and rounded and given that sort of pillow top look. And then from that point, all I need to do is set the bevel angle back to uh, vertical, so it's at zero degrees or 90 degrees, depending on how you look at it. And I'm gonna trim that off at the exact point that I need it so that when I tap it into the, uh, into the hole, it, uh, it winds up standing just slightly proud of the surface. Um, and you need to measure accurately to make sure that you're cutting it in the right place before that happens. And the final thing we'll need to do is, is sand the edges just slightly, because remember, this is a little bit oversized. So I'm gonna taper all the corners so that when I uh, tap it in with a hammer, it kind of just pushes into the fibers and gives us a really super nice tight fit. Now, even though we pre-drilled, this screw could still have some difficulty getting through there. So I've got my handy bag of wax, which everyone should have. Make sure I got a good amount of wax on the threads there. And now I'm gonna drive the screw. So we've got a couple doors and we've got a case. Now what? Well, obviously we need to put the hinges into the doors. And before we do that though, we have to make sure that these doors fit perfectly square into the opening in the way that I want them to, with the right amount of a gap around the outside perimeter of each door. Now these doors were created so that they were a little bit oversized for the case, and I recommend doing that all the time. Whenever you build doors to go into a case or onto something, build them a little bit oversized, even if it's just by a sixteenth uh, or maybe an eighth of an inch total on each dimension, because you want to be able to trim that extra material away for any little imperfections that there might be in the case. For instance, we, you know, we built this so that it would be nice and square, and it is. It's pretty close, but there's always a possibility it could be a degree or two off. And when you're looking at a nice, tight-fit inset door, a couple degrees makes a big difference, and when you see that gap all the way around the door, that's where you're gonna see the problem. So it then becomes an eyesore. The good thing is because we have some of that extra material here, we can trim it strategically so that those gaps are all even all the way around, so it gives the illusion of absolute perfection. Um, so let's hope it's perfect, let's shoot for perfect, but if it's not, this is where we're gonna fix those issues. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take one door at a time here, and like I said, it's too big. It's not going all the way in. It's hitting the top here. So I've got the bottom resting on the bottom of the case and I pull it to the right and I'm looking for a gap. I wanna make sure that this right angle here is pretty close to perfect. And this one fortunately is. Now, if it's not, what I would do is hold it up against the side of the case, keep the long end up against the leg and trim whatever material is necessary uh, down here to make sure it sits nice and, nice and flat. If you gotta remove a little material from here, go to the miter saw, grab your hand planes, whatever it takes, just trim a little bit of that material off and make sure it sits nice and square in the case. And those are two sides now that we can be confident are nice and square. Now the next issue is the top. Now I'm not looking to get the absolute final fit here. I just wanna make sure that the door is relatively uh, uh, well, basically, I want to make sure that I can get the door into this inset here, and then I can kind of evaluate it a little bit closer. So I push it all the way back, all the way against the top, hold it in place, and I'm going to come behind the door here with a pencil right up into the corner. And I can't see what I'm doing, but I can feel it. And I'm going to draw that pencil line all the way across the back top edge of the door. Now what this line shows me is where I need to trim. And if, it's, if I see a little bit more material over here or on this side, that lets me know that it's not perfectly square, but that's okay because I can adjust my miter saw. Again, hand planes, just go right to your line. For me, I'm still doing sort of a rough fine fit if there is such a thing. So I'm just gonna use the miter saw to trim this back a little bit and then we'll see how the door fits after that. All right, let's see how we did. That 
looks pretty good. Um, it's hard to tell at this point, but that is about as perfect as that gap is going to get. Now, since it's resting on the bottom, this little teeny tiny gap at the top is not going to be enough for this door. We eventually will want to take more material off because the door has to have a gap on the top and the bottom. So whatever this gap is now with gravity uh, pulling the door down and it's resting on the bottom, you got to imagine that that gap would be split in half. So part of it given to the bottom, part of it given to the top. And even though it's a frame and panel door and everything is relatively stable, most of the movement of the piece will be from front to back, there still could be some swelling since this is going to such a humid area that I have to be aware that those doors can and probably will stick. So I want to give it a little bit more of a gap than I might normally do in an environment when I can predict exactly how much uh, moisture this thing is going to take up. All right, so let me throw the other door in here real quick, see how we're doing. Now you might be wondering why I didn't cut the doors to the exact height that I need, giving them the appropriate gap at the top and bottom. Well, the primary reason for that is the fact that um, we can't predict all of the little places where we're going to need to remove material. And once I have both doors up here, now I can get a real good visual on where I might need to remove a little bit more material to tweak the door one way or the other. If I get it to exactly the perfect height too early and then I have to make a change later, I might wind up with a much bigger gap than I really wanted in the first place. Now before I do my final cuts on the top and bottom and get everything spaced perfectly, I do want to spend a few more seconds talking about this, this line here, uh, where the vertical style meets the rail. Now this is one of those areas where you have to decide how picky do you want to be. See the thing is, I still see a little bit of a, a discrepancy here. The one on the left side is about a 64th of an inch higher than the one on the right. Now some people would be perfectly happy with that and there's nothing wrong with that, but you need to decide where you want to draw that line for yourself. For me, I've been fixated on that since I saw it and it's driving me crazy and I need to make sure that when I trim my material from the top and bottom that I do it in such a way that it gets those two lines dead on even with each other, otherwise it's going to drive me nuts. All right, so after doing the trim cuts on the bottom left of the door, we can see that the line is now perfectly even. I'm very happy with the way that looks. But if we look over here, we've got a little bit more of a gap on the left-hand door than we do on the right-hand door at the top. And actually, that's good because what I wanted to do, like I said before, is this gap is going to be split between the top and bottom. So it may look a little bit big here, but consider the fact that when the hinges are installed, uh, we're only going to have half of that gap at the top and the other half represented at the bottom. On this side, we can use a little bit more. So I'm going to trim that difference off of the top of this board. I'm not even going to have to touch the bottom uh, like I thought I would. So just a little bit extra off the top should do the trick. Now it may seem a little bit nitpicky to, to hone in on those little fine details like that and, and worry about those little tiny numbers, but to me it's very important and I think as you progress as a woodworker, you have to keep raising the bar for yourself on a practical level. Obviously, not everybody has the time to spend months and months on a single small project, but I think it's very important that we constantly challenge ourselves, raise that bar so that eventually you get to a point where you say, you know what, I know I can do that better and you do it better. Um, drawing the line too soon can uh, sort of rob you of valuable learning experiences. And if you can get something to be as good as it can possibly be, then why not? That's the whole point of learning how to do this stuff. So I'm pretty happy with these results and I think it's time at this point to move on to uh, marking the locations for the hinges and cutting the mortises.